Thank you to you, those of you who are in the audience here and those that are online. Um, I'm Kevin Burnett with Wildan Financial Services. I'm one of the people um, working on this rate study for you all. So um, we'll give you a, a brief presentation of um, where things are at. Ultimately, what we're trying to get out of this meeting is get your feedback. Um, nothing's been presented to council at this point in terms of financial plans or rate alternatives or rate design or anything like that. We're still very much in the early stages of this presentation. So looking to get your feedback of what can we take forward to council, share your, um, your thoughts with them. So with that, we'll jump right in. Um, so the questions that we want to have answered or get feedback from you all from at the end of the meeting is, um, looking back at the last rate study, um, what do you think worked well in the last rate study? What did you like about the rate structures? Um, alternatively, what are areas for improvement? Are there things that you didn't like? Are there things that you wish we had have done that you would like to see done this time? Um, different considerations that we can um, examine and take forward with council. Um, so drilling down into the current rate study itself, um, so we've got a 10-year capital improvement plan for water here. It's totaling $135, $136 million over the next 10 years. Um, so that's a ramp up of where we were at in the last study. Um, so we've got some of the projects that are listed there. So these are all critical maintenance issues that need to be done. Um, the more you kick the can down the road, as they say, the more expensive it's gonna be when you get to do those projects later on down the road. Not to mention that if you don't take care of these maintenance issues, now you will have line breaks, you will have other failures that are more expensive if you're in a knee jerk reaction as opposed to a, a planned um, process for, for the capital improvement program. Um, we've got a 10 year CIP capital improvement plan for wastewater, sewer, I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, so we're looking at roughly $95 million over the next 10 years um, to maintain the sewer system. Again, that represents a ramp up of, of where we were at in the last study just two years ago. Um, in terms of some of the other financials that we're looking at, um, the utilities, both water and wastewater, have outstanding debt um, to, fund to fund past capital projects. So on the water side, we're looking at about $610,000 um, those debt issuances will, will sunset in 2030. Um, so then that debt will go away. Uh, on the sewer side, we've got um, some debt issuances there as well. They're gonna be a little bit longer term than the water ones are and for a more significant dollar amount um, there as well. You're looking at closer to $13 million um, ballpark in annual debt service payments on the sewer side. Um, wanted to provide some context of where Lake Havasu City's rates are for an average single family residential customer. Um, so this is where you are, Lake Havasu City at the far left um, at $15.98 for an average residential customer and how you would compare to your neighbors. Bearing in mind, this is just for context. You're not living in Flagstaff's, so you're not paying Flagstaff's rates. You don't live in Bullhead City, you don't pay Bullhead City's rates. You live in Lake Havasu City, so you pay Lake Havasu City's rates. Um, with that being said, there are some people who live within the city limits that are served by the EPCOR system. So we do have um, the light blue bar there for what the EPCOR rates are for those residents living in Havasu but served by EPCOR. Uh, similar presentation on the sewer side. Um, so you can see the darker green bar there is what the average rate is for Lake Havasu City. Again, just for purposes of context, you don't live in Avondale, so you're not paying Avondale's rates. You don't live in Casa Grande, so you're not paying those rates. It's just to provide you a little bit of context. And then we've got the same context for what the combined average monthly residential bill is. Um, so moving into some specifics on the current rate structure itself, um, when the last rate study was undertaken, there was the irrigation and drainage district. So those people who lived within the IDD had one rate. Um, those who lived outside of the IDD um, had a higher rate um, for water. That IDD has sunset since the last rate study was completed. So now there is no inside versus outside differential. Everybody uh, pays the same, the same rates. 
Um, the rate, water rate structure is comprised of two parts. You've got a monthly base charge. This gets assessed to your customers every month, regardless of how much water you use. So if you use 200 cubic feet, you pay that base charge. If you use 2,000 cubic feet, you pay that same um, base charge. It does increase by meter size. So the larger your meter, the higher your monthly base charge is. Um, the way the base charge is designed right now, it recovers about 30% of your overall revenue comes from the base charge. With that being said, as is typical for a utility system, both on the water and the sewer side, 80 to 90% of a utility's costs are going to be fixed. So those costs won't vary based on how much water gets sold, how much sewage gets treated. Those costs are largely fixed. It's the, the debt service that we were looking at before, that capital improvement program that we were looking at before. Uh, most of the costs of the system are going to be fixed. You'll get some, some variability in terms of chemicals. Um, you'll spend more on chemicals the more water you treat, the more sewage you treat. Uh, electricity as well, the more water you, you sell, the more sewer you treat, the electricity costs will go up. But by and large, most of your costs are going to be fixed. So of that 80 to 90 percent of cost that's fixed, we're getting 30 percent from the base charge and then the balance comes from the volume rate. Um, within the single family class itself, so if you use between zero and 500 cubic feet a month, that gets included in your base charge. So if you use 450 cubic feet a month, you're only paying the base charge. Once you get beyond that 500 cubic feet of water, um, then you start going through the tiers. And as you progress through those tiers, the 501 to 4,000 cubic feet, there's a month, there's a tiered rate, a unit cost for water that gets sold within that tier. As you move up into the next tier, the 4,001 to 10,000, you're paying a higher unit cost. So as you progress through those tiers, your unit cost for water increases. Um, the same holds true for multifamily. There's the monthly base charge and then the tiered rate. Um, the same thing for commercial, um, residential irrigation, other irrigation, and RV parks. And the reason why you'll see some different tiers for each of these customer classes as part of the last study, we undertook an analysis to look at what does it cost to serve each customer class? How much does it cost to serve the residential class? How much does it cost to serve the irrigation class? How much does it cost to serve the RV park class? So within those different customer classes, we assign cost to each of those classes. So the rates are specific to each class so that each class is paying their proportionate share of operating the water system. On the sewer side, again, we've got a monthly base charge. In this case, it's recovering about 75% of your overall revenue. If you remember back to that uh, outstanding debt slide a couple of slides ago, significantly more outstanding debt on the sewer side than there is on the water side. Again, those are those fixed costs. You have to pay that debt service every year. We don't get to go back to the bondholders and say, we didn't sell as much water this year, so we're not gonna make the payment that you think we should. That payment is fixed every year. Um, so that's part of the reason that we're recovering more revenue on the sewer side through that base charge, just because we do have that higher annual debt service, that legal obligation. Um, within that, on the residential side, so single family, multifamily, uh, apartments, condos, um, you've got a base charge that includes 500 cubic feet of water. Um, beyond that, there's a flow component, um, but there is a max. So there is a cap to how much your monthly sewer bill will be if you're a residential customer. Um, for commercial hotels, motels, and RV parks, there's the same monthly base charge. So you have a monthly base charge and then you have a flow component, but there's no max on, um, on those customer classes. So the more flows that you send to the sewer treatment plant, the higher your monthly bill would be. Uh, we met with council earlier this year uh, a couple months ago to find out what their objectives were from this race study. So this is from, from their perspective. We certainly want to hear what your perspective is and what's important to you. Um, but the top things that council identified as, as goals, um, number one was revenue stability. So making sure that there's enough money coming in on a monthly basis to cover the cost, take care of that debt service, maintain the system, the capital improvement program that we looked at, um, make sure that you've got clean and efficient water, um, that's drinking water quality um, for customers, and then that the, the sewage is being treated appropriately um, before it's being discharged. Uh, water conservation was something that council brought up as a concern to them. Um, water being a finite resource, we can't just waste water. Um, 
That's not to say that we're trying to restrict how much water you use. We just want people to be using the water efficiently, whether it's from the residential side uh, or the non-residential side. Um, and then the last two there, customer impact and cost of service equity go hand in hand. Um, so customer impact, that's how it affects the customer's bills. So um, we recognize that probably rates are gonna need to go up at some point or the rate structures will change a little bit and that's gonna have an impact on the customers. We can do something to try and mitigate what those impacts to customers are gonna be, but ultimately there is gonna be some impact. So um, being cognizant of, of customers and how the decisions that are made are gonna imp ultimately impact the customers. Um, and then the cost of service equity, that's getting into those different customer classes that we were looking at and making sure that each customer class is paying its proportionate share so that we don't have single family subsidizing RV parks or single family isn't um, subsidizing multifamily or the condos that everybody is paying um, their proportionate share. Um, so with that, we're gonna move into um, some of the discussions that have been had on rate structures. Again, nothing's been decided yet, nothing's been adopted. We're still very early on in the process. Um, the financial plan has not been developed and finalized yet. We haven't done any rate design. These are just some ideas that are being batted around that we wanted to get your reaction to. And certainly, if you have other ideas, we wanna hear them as well. So some refinements or changes to the existing rate structures, specifically for water. Um, we looked at the tiers a little bit before. So one of the questions that we're, we're looking to counsel and to you all is, do we have the right number of tiers? Do we have the right number of tiers? Do we have enough, the right amount of water use in each tier? So that first tier, the zero to 500 that was included in the base charge, is that the right amount? Should it be zero to 200? Should it be zero to 400? What's that right number? Um, within the upper tiers themselves too, when we look at conservation, if we're trying to encourage conservation, can we tighten up those tiers so that you get less water use at those tiers to try and encourage conservation or are those tiers appropriate as they stand now? Um, some of the discussion that we've had um, with the council and with the public and, and during the tail end of the, of the last rate study was there is not a perfect matching between when the council adopts new rates, new rates go into effect and when RV parks, homeowners associations when they adopt their budgets for the year. So oftentimes they're adopting their budget on a calendar year basis. So January 1 through December 30th. Well, if council adopts a new rate structure that goes into effect in September or October, there's that mismatch and are the HOAs, are the RV parks able to adjust their budgets in order to absorb whatever change it is that comes from the adopted financial plan and um, the RV parks and the, the new rate structures. And we're also understanding that there's some requirements or limitations of how much an HOA can raise their, their dues on an annual basis. So we wanna make sure that we're talking with those groups and making sure that if we recommend a 5% increase in sewer rates and the HOA can only raise their dues 2%, then we've got a bit of a mismatch there. And is there a way to do some phasing over time to accommodate um, those issues while still maintaining every class paying that their, their proportionate share and not having any, any subsidization? Um, some further discussion on the, on the water rate structure. Um, so the current vacancy rate, is that the term? It, the current vacancy rate per the census in Lake Havasu City is about 25%. So what we're saying there is we've got 25% of customers um, are not paying the volume rate of the water rate structure. With that being said, we, had, we looked at the, the capital projects that are coming down. We've got the debt service that needs to get paid, 80 to 90% of our, our costs being fixed but we've got a fairly significant portion of the customer base that is only paying the base charge, but not um, the volume rate. And at 30%, that base charge is not covering all of our, uh, our fixed costs. So one of the ideas that's being batted around is um, for the, the smallest meter size right now, the monthly base charge is $9.02. And we're relying on some of that volume rate in order to cover those fixed costs. Well, if you don't have any volume that particular month, you're not contributing to those fixed costs at the same level as a full-time resident is. So maybe a higher base charge 
should be assessed for months where there isn't that volume rate. Maybe it's $12 a month instead of the $9 a month or whatever, whatever the number turns out to be, just so that we're got, getting some equal footing between um, the vacation homes, the part-time residents, and those residents that are here full-time. It's an option. Um, it would provide benefit to the city in terms of having uh, more revenue, more reliable revenue stream coming in. At the same time, it provides some administrative burden to the city to figure out which month a customer is gonna be charged the $9 a month versus which months are they gonna be charged the $12 a month. It can, it can cause some confusion amongst the residents. So those are things that we need to um, flush out further and, and see where it goes. Um, some ad other discussions that have been had on um, the water rate side. So I mentioned right now you're getting 30% of your revenue through that base charge. Is that the right amount? Given that 80 to 90% of our costs are fixed, should we be shooting at 35% revenue recovery from the base charge or 40% recovery from the base charge? Um, so that's something that we can look at. It, will it would provide greater revenue stability to the city um, the base charges are generally considered a guaranteed income source. You know how much money you're going to get coming in every month. Um, so that's a bonus. Um, the downside of it is the higher you make the base charge, the harder it is on the lower volume residents. So you're getting a break for those that are, have high water use because the more money you get from the base charge, the less you're reliant on the volume rate. So you're giving a bit of a break to those larger volume users at the expense of the, the lower volume users. It also limits our ability to send the conservation signal. So if we wanna have the tiered rate structure that we're looking at and ratcheting up what the unit cost is for those upper tiers to try and convince people to conserve, if we're getting more of our revenue from the base charge, less from the volume rate, you don't really have that conservation signal associated with it. The flip side of that, is conservation tiered rate. So that's where we would ratchet up what those unit costs are in the upper tiers um, for, for the water rate. Again, that's gonna send the conservation signal. If we do our job properly, the higher unit cost is gonna incentivize people to use less water, but then that means if they're using less water, the city's recovering less revenue, they're less revenue stable, the revenue's more at risk. So there's a bit of a trade off going on there. Um, on the sewer side, some of the refinements that we're looking at right now, as I said, on the residential side, you've got that two components. You've got the monthly base charge and then you've got a flow component. Um, one of the ideas that's being thrown around is just changing it to a flat charge. So instead of having the two components, it might be $60 a month every month, regardless of how much discharge you have into the sewer system. Um, when we looked at the last rate study prior to the rates that are in place right now on the non-residential side, um, we had more than a dozen customer classifications for non-residential. We had a rate for mortuary, we had a rate for supermarkets, we had a rate for retail, we had a rate for office buildings, we had a rate for fitness centers. We said that's too much, there's too much confusion, it's harder to administer so we're going to consolidate that. So we consolidated it down so that we now have a commercial class, a general commercial class, hotel, motel, and then RV parks. Did we get it right? Should we have more than just those few customer classes? Did we consolidate too much? Those are things that, that we're looking for some feedback on. Um, in terms of some of the pros and cons of what we're looking at for, for the sewer rate structure um, on the Flat rate side, so this is an equity issue and it depends how you define equity. So we could say that if every residential customer is gonna be charged $60 a month, that's equitable. I'm paying $60 a month, my neighbor's paying $60 a month, the person across town is paying $60 a month, it's equitable, we're all paying the same. The other side of that equity argument though is, I live by myself, um, I'm a single person on the road for my job three out of four weeks of the year. Why am I paying the same amount for my sewer bill as my neighbor who's married and has two teenagers who are showering two or three times a day and discharging more water into the sewer system? From an equity standpoint, they're using more water, they're discharging more into the sewer system. Why am I paying the same as them? So those are a couple of things that we're looking at in terms of, of the flat rate structure. 
Um, going back to the plus side, again, that it provides that revenue stability for the city. You know you're going to be getting that $60 a month or whatever it is every month from every customer. It makes it easier to plan for the capital projects. It makes it easier to make your debt service payments. It makes it easier from a financial standpoint for the city. And administratively, it's a lot easier for them as well. Um, in terms of the of the customer classes, so part of the reason that we consolidated it is, was because of the administrative burden on staff side um, in terms of administrating all those classes. Uh, it took some of the subjectivity out of it. Um, the example we gave at the earlier session was um, you had one rate for a car wash and one rate for a service station. So if the service station has a car wash, which category do they fall in? Are they primarily a car wash that happens to have a pump or two, or is it primarily a service station that happens to offer a car wash as an option? So which rate would they fall into under those, um, under those categories? So it takes out some of that arbitrariness and it also makes it easier on staff, as I said, from an administrative standpoint. So with that, that was a very quick run through of uh, where we were at before, what we're looking at today. Again, as I said, no decisions have been made at this point in time. We haven't presented financial plans to council yet. We haven't provided rate options. Um, these are just some things that are, are, are going around in our, in our heads that we're thinking about. Um, this is the, the first day of stakeholder meetings of many. So we wanted to get some information, some feedback from you all, what your thoughts are. Um, so that we can appropriately convey that to council and, and let you know what the public thinks. So with that, we'll open it up to any questions. I'll bring over the mic if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments. Yes, could I find out what, when we had the last rate structure, what went wrong with that rate increase? Because I own a, a multifamily home that... Uh, is just family members in it, so I've got no rate. It's a triplex. And our rate, we were paying $80 a month for our water. It went to over $280 a month. And this is what was a problem with the condos and everything else. What happened there that the rate went so high? You know, I somebody, it looked like when they picked that particular, because I believe they were given like four or five different things to tick, and it looked like to me somebody just closed their eyes and picked one, and nobody did the actual study as to what's going to happen. Because there, it, we, we actually used 1,000 gallons less on that next month, and the bill went to $280. So can you tell us what happened in that study or why it went wrong? Yes. Yeah, so when we did do the study last time, so you're right, there were several different options that we looked at, and we looked at um, the customer impacts for the different customers as well. The difficulty in projecting what everybody's bill is going to be is we looked at data as a whole. So we looked at the multifamily class as a whole. What's the average use for the multifamily class? How much is, what's the average usage for the commercial class? So when you look at it at that macro level, um, that's where the decisions were made. So we, we tried to pick some representative customers from within the groups but at 30,000, 30,000, Kevin, 30,000 customers, we weren't able to do the individual bill for 30,000 customers. So evidently yours was one of the ones that fell without, outside of the macro that we were looking at. So that's part of the reason we wanted to have these stakeholder meetings is get that feedback from you there and how we can improve and, and do things better. I would think that couldn't we just do a, flat rate, a flat rate charge like you're talking about, and raise the, the, the sewer and the, and the water to, you know, $25 for the base charge or something, and everybody then is going to pay that. And then you could, because you were, the city's raising the revenue, we wouldn't have to raise up the cost of the sewer so much, and the cost of the water would stay the same. And everybody, uh, uh, the snowbirds, for example, they would end up having to pay that extra because even though they're not here for six months, but at least they're paying into the infrastructure to help the city improve that. And that's the way I think that it should go. And then everybody should have a, a, a certain water charge too, because people mm -hmm. that have pools, when we don't have a pool, but a lot of people have pools, it doesn't cost them that much to fill that pool every week when they lose three inches of water 
uh, up in the air and they just refill it up and it only cost them a few bucks. And even if it pushes their rate up just a little bit, it's not that big of a deal. So they don't have to worry about conservation. Whereas if I try to conserve at my house and take less showers or, or whatever, the bill still goes up. And if everybody paid a flat fee, at least there would be a steady revenue. And that's, and I will say, so um, if I happen to be looking down, I'm jotting notes down. I'm not trying to ignore anybody. Um, but the flat charge is certainly something that could be considered um, from the finance director standpoint. You just made her day. If a flat charge with water, she knows how much revenue is coming in every month. Her job just got a whole lot easier and her stress level just came down. Um, I don't see Greg in here right now. He would be on the opposite side of things saying, I have to manage how much water we need. If you just have a flat charge, then there's no incentive for me to, as you say, conserve. I can have that river running down my driveway and running down the street because it doesn't matter how much water I use every month because. Well, but it would if you're going to have to pay for the water itself. If you're still going to be paying for that, you can set up your tiers however you want to. Correct. But. But yeah, but like I said, people with pools here, they don't have to pay that much to put water back in their pool every week. Right. And, and I, you know, for the other people that don't have pools, it's not fair for them. Sure. And, but then when, like you said, when the, when the snowbirds are gone, they're not paying anything. Right. But yet, you know, the, somebody's got to pay for the infrastructure. Correct. Correct. So I think the flat rate charge on both sides kind of solves some of that problem. And then you have a steady revenue, and everybody has to pay it. It's commercial, the whole, everybody. Yep, yeah, it does. And you're right, that helps with the revenue stability and making sure that the part-time residents, the snowbirds, are paying for it. But again, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that the higher we make that base charge or the flat charge, the lower volume users are more penalized, not penalized, more affected by it because it consumes so much more of their bill. And there's, so it's certainly a trade-off, not... Not trying to dismiss your, your thoughts at all, but yeah, that's my job of trying to balance everything that we discuss. So thank you. So um, first of all, people with pools do, do conserve. I want to just get that out. But also, um, so the question I have, when you, when you came in, I, you have a tough job, so I don't, I don't envy <laughs> you. When you, when you, was it two years ago, three, two and a half years ago when you did the first study? Yes. Um, 21. I, I went to those meetings and I thought I heard that the main reason that the, the study was being made was to make up the IDD cost of about $5 million that was going away. And this study was, did the city give you different information to say we need to make up infrastructure costs now also, or I'm, I'm just confused because we were told that we just had to make up this $5 million IDD. And now it seems like I was at the other budget planning meeting and half the stuff on the infrastructure for water and sewer was red line. We can't afford it. So it seems like we're, did, did something change in the last couple of years that, that you, while you're doing this study? No, yeah. that, that's a good question, and that's my fallacy for not expressing that as well. So you're right. The, one of the, the precursors to the previous study was the IDD going away and the loss of revenue associated with that. That's still the case. One of the financial plans that we developed last time around was we know we're going to be losing this much revenue from the IDD. What does the rate increase look like if we try and recover that all at once? And it was a massive spike to the rate. So we decided that we'd phase that in over time. So, um, yes, the, the part of it is the increased cap, the review. The revised capital program that the city has put together, but at the same time, we're still in that phased in recovery of the IDD. So we have not solved that, solved that issue um, from the last go around. So that is still a component. And that's my fallacy for not calling that out at the beginning. Yeah. Hi, uh, I've been here a few times. I'm <laughs> Mark McNabb from uh, Sherlock Holmes down the road here on Swanson. Um, I wonder if there's uh, anything that the city has on how many units are basically being used by snowbirds throughout the winter months and then they take off during, you know, this time of the year. I know the last time I was here, I spoke at the council meeting and uh, we had... We have 59 units in our complex. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we had like 
57 of them occupied. Mm -hmm. And I made the point that, you know, in the summertime, that changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. And right now, like, I'm going to be going home next week. But um, right now, currently, we have um, 49 units that are vacant. And that number is probably going to fall by about four more. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be down to, you know, very few people actually living there. One of our concerns from our um, homeowners is that uh, that number, we always kind of felt like the last time when you talk about 2021, Mm -hmm. when we looked at that, that was such a huge number for us that that would basically put us out of business because we could not keep up with that kind of uh, rate increase. And I know our homeowners were all worried about it. And I think, you know, besides Sherlock Holmes, it was the rest of the folks around that owned um, homeowners uh, situations like multifamily, condos, um, townhouses, so on. So I was wondering if the city does know what the population blooms to during those months during the winter when you have such a large usage and what it drops to when you have summer usage? I have a partial answer for you. I'm not sure if anybody from the city staff does. Um, so I'm working very closely with Kevin at this point to to go through the billing data and make sure that we have good billing data. I'm sure he's tired from hearing from me at this point in time and all the questions I ask. Um, we've looked at the residential side. So for a 12 month period as a whole, the single family residential, we've got about 5% of the bills are for zero usage. I haven't had a chance to look at specifically the winter versus the summer or any of those distinctions. And I haven't drilled down into multifamily yet, but for an annual basis, single family residential, you're looking at about 5% of the total bills are issued at a zero water use. No, that's just single family. I haven't had a chance to drill down into the multifamily or condos at this point in time yet. So. Yeah, I think most of the condo folks, or at least the associations around town, would be really interested mm-hmm. in that number because I think that's where we were looking at. Right. You know, a, a huge increase last time around, and we obviously didn't right. want to see that come around sure. this time. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that we're we're working through for you and everybody else. Okay, thank you. And to that point, uh, about 25% are winter visitors. Okay. And Kevin, could you touch on a little bit as far as we have a lot of uh, HOAs and condo associations in here right now. Can you touch on a little bit about the similarities between a single family residence and a uh, condo? Sure, I'll try. (laughs) Um, So... That's part of what we're doing here and part of why I'm, I'm sure I'm driving Kevin so crazy is we're trying to get that better understanding of what's the relationship within Lake Havasu City itself for single family use versus condo use versus multifamily use. There's a lot of industry data out there. The industry data suggests that condos or multifamily or apartments use, use approximately 70 to 75 percent of the water use that a single family home does. Um, that's empirical data from the industry. Some of the issues that you run into there is that typically a single family home um, will have a lot. So there'll be irrigation going on um, from that meter versus uh, an HOA or a multifamily apartment complex. There might be a separate irrigation meter. Um, so the water that is used by the resident isn't, you know, an apples to apples comparison to a single family home. Um, I've lived in some apartments where each individual unit was metered, so I knew what my monthly water use actually was. In other cases, I lived in apartments where there was a master meter. So there was one meter or two meter going to the entire building, and they just said, okay, the monthly bill is $100. We've got 20 units, so everybody pays this much, and you don't have that, um, that information readily available to you on Um, if I cut back on my water use, it's going to impact my bill this way or, um, whatever, because it's, it's the, the, the building as a whole. So you don't have that. You don't always have perfect information and you don't always have control over what your water bill is going to be depending upon how it's set up. Is that what you were looking for, Anthony? 
Thank you. I have a couple of questions, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, first, you know, you, someone said you have a tough job. I tell everybody in here, the people set, setting up on the diocese are the people that have the, the hard job in deciding what's Absolutely. going to happen for the city. Yeah. So, but Absolutely. thank you for what you're doing, supplying the information. Um, first, I'm, uh, I'm from Havasu RV Resorts. Okay. Someone asked how many people are uh, snowbirds are mm -hmm. here during the, or during the summer. Mm -hmm. We have 397 lots. 40 to 50 are all that's there full time. Okay. Out of, out of that, everybody else has their sewer. There's no sewer discharge. They may have a little bit of water, but, uh, just to irrigate, but that's about it. Everything is metered in our park. Everything. All water to every individual lot, all the master lot water and our sewer is also, uh, measured and, and, uh, we're on web, uh, EBCOR. Um, so, you know, all, we're already paying three and a half times what the city is paying for, for water. And actually, I wish I had the city services, not because of the cost, but because of the service. Sure. But, uh, so I'm only, I'm, I'm more focused on the sewer side. Mm -hmm. Um, when the first proposal came out for our, in 2020, um, we spent 30, about $36,000 in sewer costs. Uh, with the first proposal that came out in 21, uh, our, those were going to go up to almost $83,000. So huge, huge. And with our CCNRs, um, I know many other resorts, I don't, I don't know all of their rates, mm -hmm. but the monthlies are anywhere from $54 to $150. Our CCNRs, um, only allow us to, um, to implement one time a year, a max of 10% increase. Right. But that also has to cover all the other cost increases. Yeah. So a multi-year thing would be much, much more palatable yep. to, to us. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I did have a question. You made a comment that Eb, or the, the sewer rates, the fixed costs, the fixed charge on the sewer rates currently are based on water consumption. I don't know how the city knows that because we're on EBCOR and we have the EBCOR meter. So I don't know how that fixed cost is, is decided. Um, we would be very supportive of uh, a metered service. We, you know, we have our, you know, we have our meter. We know exactly how much sewer discharge we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be really uh, favorable to that. So, um, and uh, also the, that our infrastructure inside our park is not owned by the city, isn't owned by EBCOR. We own all of it. So there's no service. If we have a line failure or any problem, we're the ones that have to pay the cost to fix it. It doesn't come back to the city or EBCOR. So take that into consideration, please. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. On the water side, we have one EBCOR meter. And then after that is all our park's infrastructure. And we have uh, meters throughout the park. Every, um, every lot has a meter on it. So once a month, we read that. We go through the math and we pay. For we use that to figure out what proportion of the, the, the total original bill is paid by that property owner. No, it's not. We're looking at it. Read 397 meters every month. <laughs> oh. I would imagine most condos are serviced by one major meter. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and their CCNRs aren't flexible enough to adjust for inflation costs, but I've got to pay it. So I don't think that's right. Thanks. And if we can wait for the mic uh, for your questions, thank you. Thank you. In regards to the CCNRs, it depends on the board to change it, so it can be changed okay. at any time. Okay. And there's a, I know he's shaking his head no, but it does. Exactly, but is is the CCR and that board governs that CCNR. Um, in regards to the infrastructure, we've got $8 million sitting in ARPA money. Why can't some of that money be used to compensate some of the rate hikes? As for that question, as for water and wastewater, those are uh, those are separate funds, and, and that type of fund can't be put into that. Yeah, it's restricted, exactly. Yep. Next question, anybody? Nope. Yes. Uh, uh, if you can, can we? I'll get to you next. It would seem to me that if you've got a meter for water going in and water going out, they ought to be pretty close to the same. When you instead of five times different for sewer water going out, what are we doing with all that water that we take in there and we don't we don't expel it? What happens to that water? So, so that's why we usually look at the average winter consumption in those in those months. You're primarily correct that it's going to be water in, water out through the system. It's when you get into the summer months and you have irrigation coming off of that meter then it's not being recaptured into the sewer system, it's going into the ground and then, um, so that's why there would be the disconnect in some months between how much water you're using and what your sewer flows would be. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna go along with, it's a difficult job. Um, I kind of see it all, we have, we live in a single resident, we have a pool. Mm -hmm. There's just two of us. Our water usage is pretty minimal. We've got our irrigation down to a minimum. We had an irrigation uh, meter, we still do, which has to have a backflow certification every year. And I just got the notice in the mail. But I, when I see there's only 24 counts, is that saying that they've switched my meter over? And as far as I know, they're paying or I, we're paying the city an additional charge for the electronic records on that meter along with the certification of the backflow. I went to the city when the first time the proposal was going in, and they were going to come take the meter out, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But when I put it in, I had to pay a deposit, and I said, well, you know what, it's fine. Take the meter out. I don't need it, but I need my deposit back. They said no. So I, most of my stuff's with the city is how do we handle that? I'm okay with them coming and locking it up, and then I'll just run it all through the main meter. It's fine. Uh, but... They could never answer the question. They just said, no, no, we're not going to refund the deposit. But um, the snowbirds that come in, and I have two in on our cul-de-sac, when they go home, they have pools, and they have to be maintained, and their water levels. So they're using some water, and there's probably a lot of exceptions. Sure. But it's a, it's a difficult job because, you know what, I know we have to do this, but what's the easy way? Uh, on the condo side, and we happen to own a condo here in town, um, is it easier to do it in reverse? I think the last proposal came in at the maximum number the first year and then kind of phased down. Mm -hmm. It seems like it'd be easier to go the other way. It'd be harder financially to do it, but it's easier as a as an owner to deal with it progressively going up. Right. Just a thought. No, it, it's a good thought. And if I go back to like those water and sewer capital improvement programs, so that was over the 10 year period. So one of the things that we'll be doing and going back to the city and to Greg and saying that 135 million for water, that's 13 and a half million dollars a year. Is there an opportunity to back end it a little bit so that we have less at the front end, give us some time to build up the rate so that we're not, as you say, high on the front end and then taper off. Maybe we do do it the reverse. I'm not an engineer, so I'll have to let, rely on Greg to say, no, Kevin, you can't do that. The system will break if we try and do that. So go back to the drawing board. Um, but that's certainly one of the conversations that we're planning on having um, as we dig deeper into the financial plan is what opportunities do we have to address some of those concerns? I think last time that was implemented, I remember coming to the meeting and it was out the door. Mm -hmm. It was too late, but 
I was surprised that the mayor didn't know that a lot of the condominium units were fed off of a one main meter. He had no idea what the effect was going to be to the HOAs. Um, and then, <laughs> I don't want to mention any names, but a city councilman that I happen to know said they were given two proposals to deal with, and it became so complex, they said they gave it to that department and said, here, you choose the better of the two. And I was kind of like, oh, my gosh. I mean, it, he said it's complex. I said, well, yeah, but, you know, that's part of the job is absorbing and, and deciding, you know. And I know it's, it's a difficult job. I wouldn't want to be in that position. But you're going to have people not happy no matter which way it goes. Right. And, and we're trying to be methodical on this that's why we're here with you all to begin with before we've even developed the financial plan so that we can hear your feedback we're going to have regular meetings with the council so that they get progress reports along the way um, so hopefully we get more information out there better information it's better digested um, this time around we do a better we do a better job of presenting that information so that they can make educated decisions and don't um, don't feel constrained yeah so I, I would just make a suggestion that when mm -hmm. you're good, good presentation, um, I would I would weigh heavily on the um, the infrastructure having to be updated and repaired and kept up to date because and we have I don't know if you guys know we have sixty thousand seven hundred and seventy seven full time residents here now in Havasu. That's our that's our full time base. And then with the, when the snowbirds come in, it probably goes up to I don't know ninety thousand. Who, who knows? But but. Um, a water conservation part, I think you alluded to, we do a really good job of water conservation. Yeah. So I wouldn't tell people we're going to raise your rates so you could, could control your water because I think people are really do a good job already. We only use a little bit more than half of our annual uh, acre foot, footage of water that we, that we have on, you know, that we allocated. So we're doing a really good job of that. I would just make it uh, emphasize on the infrastructure because it's old infrastructure and it has to be repaired and kept up and, you know, it's not going to go away. Uh, my question is, uh, when they read the, like the water meters and things, do they do that by eye or is that uh, every month? Do they electronically? Okay, and, they, and they're, they do that all the time. And then my next question, uh, Riviera, is that system figured in? Are you guys figuring that into here, or do they have their own system? What do they have out there? Because I, I picked up a brochure on, on Winterfest, and they got 670 lots out there that they're going to sell. Is that figured into this, or are they have their own system? What What's... So, yes. So part of what we do in developing the financial plan is looking at how many residents, how many accounts do you have today? And then what do we know is coming and what's the anticipated timing of that so that we have two pieces to the revenue. So revenue increases every year based on the growth in the system. So if we have new people move in, if we have 600, 700 um, new homes coming into play. So that gets factored into the financial plan in terms of an increase in revenue just based on increase in population, increase in new development. Then the second piece of it is um, to the extent that revenue from growth alone, it, revenue, additional revenue from growth alone isn't sufficient to cover um, the cost going forward. So if we're growing at 2% and inflation is 8%, we've still got 6% that we're down. So that's where we would factor in additional revenue increases through rates. But yes, the long answer to your question is we are factoring in um, the new developments that we're aware of in the timing. Is that going into the system? It will. They won't have one of their own? No. Are they going to put in their own wells or are they going to be in the city wells? Anthony's telling me it's coming from the city well, city service. It's our residence. It's in Lake Havasu City's limits. Uh, I just wanted to um, comment on the the metering. Mm -hmm. I can only speak for Sherlock Holmes, but we have three meters at our complex for the 59 units. We've got uh, water flowing in. 
that's going into the buildings. Uh, we got water and sewage flowing out, and then we've got an irrigation meter. So uh, that's the way ours was done, and ours was, I think, back in the 1970s. So I would think that m more uh, modern units would probably have the same setup as far as uh, metering goes. I, I would imagine, I mean, that's not even possible in a motel situation, and there's a lot of motel rooms in town. So, But they have a meter on what's coming out, is that right, most of them, the newer ones? Uh, Kevin's saying no. No. Can they opt for that if they want, if they want to pay the cost to do that? My limited experience on sewer meters is that they're, very expensive and not particularly reliable, but that's just my limited experience. Kevin's giving me the nod that, yes, that's his experience as well. How many motel or hotel and motel rooms are in town, I wonder? There's quite a few. Could there be a uh, sort of $5 conservation charge on a motel room? Like, hold on. For each night it gets booked out. So there you go. John there. Put, put a little charge on there for each motel room that gets booked out a night. That's the people coming mainly from mm -hmm. California. Let them pay a little bit of this infrastructure. I mean, when you go to Las Vegas anymore, and the resort, resort fees, fees are just outrageous. And here, they're not that bad at all. So I think nobody would bat an eye for $5, uh, an extra charge on their room, and seeing it was like water conservation. And that would be another way to generate a, a few hundred thousand dollars toward the infrastructure. I don't know how many rooms there actually are here in town. <laughs> well, yeah, I probably would. It, it, it would be another administrative detail for staff. From from our perspective, from the from the rate design perspective, we would want to be able to tie that five dollars to a cost. Um, if it's just five dollars for the sake of having a five dollar charge, then you're getting into the arbitrary and capricious realm of things if we said that that five dollars is a dedicated revenue source to paying down the debt or it's to paying you know such and such infrastructure then i would be more comfortable with it so that's certainly something that we can explore sure so the question i had was uh we had a cap on the sewer Mm -hmm. Is that going to, are they planning on doing that still? Because on the multifamilies, um, that was one of the things they changed when mm -hmm. we had the reversal in October. Uh, are they planning on doing that again? Um, we talked about the base charge changing right. on the water end, but what mm -hmm. about the sewer? Is so there be at a this, cap? yeah. At this point in time, we have not made any decisions on what we're doing, so I'm sure with and without will be options that get presented to council. Um, we'll show what the financial impacts are of both, the pros and cons of both, um, but I'm not going to stand here right now and say that, yes, we're definitively going away with it or we're definitively going to keep it. It's it's something that's still... Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, if I can help out, I am uh, Jess, city manager here in Lake Havasu City. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, a lot of conversations with like the, the multifamily and the, and the condos and what that means in relation to single family homes that, that uh, comment was made, made earlier. So during the last uh, rate study, um, there was a, um, an action taken by the, uh, through, the, through the rate study to, to take a look at a little bit of equity between a single family homeowner and a condo homeowner. So I think uh, I don't remember the exact figures. If anybody on the team can remind me, let me know. But I think we had for the base rate or the flat charge for sewer for a condo was about nine dollars, and then uh, eleven fifty. And then Kevin, what was the base rate for uh, for sewer? Uh, it was all I guess uh, determined by the base rate for a single family, forty one. So we had eleven dollars. A condo owner is is paying for a base charge on 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 sewer, 
and $41 a single family homeowner is paying for base charge on sewer. Now there could be two people living in a condo and there could be two people living in a single family home. Uh, there's still the need for three wastewater treatment plants and 400 plus miles of water and 400 plus miles of sewer lines with, throughout the community. So that was, so that was some of those conversations in terms of the, uh, the equity, right? If you're putting the same strain on the system, why is one uh, um, property owner paying more or less than, than the other one? So that uh, caused a lot of, uh, of some, some headaches and some surprise and some shock because you went from $11 to try to get closer to where the single family was, bring that down uh, a little bit and, and then get to where we're, we need to be uh, you know, across, the, across the board. So that was a big shock for the condo owners. So it, like I'm paying $11, now I'm paying you know, 40, 50 bucks or whatever that uh, ended up uh, being at, uh, at that time. So, and that's the conversation that that's Kevin, Kevin's having and, and Anthony kind of alluded to is, um, where is the middle ground? What makes the most sense? Should condo owners uh, um, pay less than the single family ho uh, homeowners? As a condo owner, it's not an issue. It's just a matter of going One, one second. It, it's a matter of going from that nine to that 41 yeah. and, and the, HO, the HOA can't, can't absorb that. And, and I look at it as a homeowner and as a condo owner. I say, it's really fair. I mean, yeah, two people and two people. It's the same amount. It's, I'm surprised because I hear that 75% and I can understand that because you don't have that outside irrigation. You don't have property in most cases. But, you know, it's just, and I, that's what the other meeting, and I, I didn't realize it was back in 2021, but there was just an uproar because they figured that out the numbers when the bill came and everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute. And, you know, if it got everybody awake and now it's okay. So we know a number's coming, but can it be phased in? And if you have enough advance notice, you can plan for it. So. Yeah, great point. Uh, and that, that's part of that conversation that we need to, need to have, right? On the subject for the budgets for the HOAs, um, the city has a different fiscal year. You know, most Correct. of the condos start in January. So in the past, I used to call, I had the same lady from the city that would let us know what the rates are doing. But with this big increase, it is hard for them. And yes, we can vote. Most, it goes by your bylaws, CCNRs. But there is a statutory amount that we cannot change. I called the attorney for, you know, that we use. And it was, you know, a lot of them are 10% unless it's not, if you have nothing in your bylaws, then you can go up to 20 increase. But most people have a cap, so it's going to be hard for them to change that fast, even with like 30 days, 60 days. It depends on when the city makes that decision. And I didn't know when you're going to be, of course, making that decision. And when I, I manage a couple units and it's hard to project, I had to guess at what you would do and when that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I did use some numbers, and actually, I have the whole formula figured out. But yeah, it's it is hard, um, and I understand your your issue on the tiering. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do the base charge um, increase, are you going to do also the tiered rate, or we're not sure? We're still deciding on that. So we're still deciding on that. the The analogy that we normally use on the water rates or the water rate revenue is if you think of it as a balloon. So one end is the volume rate, the other end is the fixed charge rate, the base charge rate. So the balloon is how much revenue we need to generate. So we can squeeze the base charge end and force more into the, the volume rate end, or we can squeeze the other end and have less on the volume side, more on the base charge side. Overall, we're still getting the same amount of revenue. It's just how we do that that allocation. So that's what we're still trying to work through um, with council to give them some different options for consideration and then um, bring it back to stakeholders to see what their opinion on it is as well. Um, in terms of your other questions, so we're hoping to have some preliminary results to council in June, um, towards the end of June for the June meeting there. Um, so again, we want to make sure that we we're not sitting on our hands during this entire time, but we want to make sure that we're slow enough and thoughtful enough to provide all that information, not just to the council, but to you all as well, um, so that we can make the decision. So um, our goal is to have something in the September time frame, um, similar to what we uh, what has been done in the past. So like a September every year kind of a thing, so that you would have some, um, some idea of, of what the rate increases are going to be um, at the same time. Um, the information that we'll be developing and presenting to council now is based on what we know today. So if we have an incredibly wet year 
this upcoming year and revenues don't come in as they anticipate because it is a wet year, then the rate increases might need to be higher than we had originally projected. Vice versa, if it's an incredibly dry year and there's more water use than we had projected, then the future year rate increase may not need to be as high as we had projected. But to that, we will develop a five-year plan of what the five-year financials are, what the five-year rate schedule is going to look like, um, so that we can try and give you as much notice and as much information as we can as you move forward with your own budgeting. Yeah, well, I tried to recommend increasing them anyway because I know the city needs the money. It's going to happen. They're going to have to charge for it, but it's hard sometimes to get the the board of directors to agree and the association to increase their dues. I mean, they have to increase their dues, and if they don't do it every year, they're not going to keep up with the city water bill. That alone is usually the biggest, largest bill an HOA has. So it's, you know... Again, the goal of this process is to gather your feedback and, and get your thoughts as to what you'd like to see as we develop those uh, rate possibilities. Thank you. I was just uh, looking through your information that you passed out here, and I have a question. And I'm looking at the outstanding debt, and I see that uh, water, underwater, you're gonna, there's going to be a retiring of six hundred thousand dollars a year in um annual debt uh between now and 2030 2030 is only seven years is that taken into account in your calculations of of the you said you're pu putting together a five-year plan and mm -hmm. such so that that service reduction will be included yes so when we develop our financial plans, we develop a 10-year plan for purposes of providing it to staff of what we think is going to happen over the next 10 years. As you can imagine, the further we get from today, the cloudier our crystal ball gets. So the projections get a little bit weaker the further we get out from today. So we look at a 10-year and then we zero in on a five-year in terms of providing you all what we think is going to happen in terms of your rates for the next five years. So yes, we will be taking into account that those two two debt issuances will drop off in 27 and 2030. Bearing in mind that one of the options that we'll be presenting to council is debt funding for that, those capital improvements that we have programmed in. So these ones may fall off and there may be other ones come in. Um, so we're gonna have a no debt option going forward so that you would be debt free on the water side in 2030. Um, but then there will be another one that would have uh, a 20 year debt maybe starting in 2026 that would carry through 2046. So. Um, those will be options that we present going forward. Okay. Thank you. As we've listened to your presentation today, the one word that keeps popping up in my mind here is tears. Every day, if you work with tears, you got some options. You can make you can make base rates at each tier. You can put tears inside you at the risk of revving up the administrative staff. You don't need to get that far gone on it, but I live in a big city in the summertime, and we've got a, our, our water service services tiers. You get residential tier, flat rate, then you go up from there with tier, tier, tier. There's a, there's a limit there whether you can stand that, but I think it'll give you something to shoot at. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? All right, well, thank you. Oh. I guess uh, I had asked the question before, if you guys could keep us up to date, is there a way that we can be on like a website or something that we can listen to the upcoming discussions that are gonna be had with city council and that for those of us that are leaving the area for the, for the summer? All the information and continued uh, conversations with council will be on the city website. Uh, we'll also um, take notes of if you've reached out to myself, uh, via email or uh, phone, uh, I will continue to compile a list and make sure that you're kept up to date as we move through the process. Uh, suggestion. Yes. Meetings down here in Lake Havasu City. 
I, I kind of disagree with the number that was thrown out, 25% of snowbirds. I think it's a lot higher than that. And uh, it would be nice if we had some of these meetings like this when they're here, than whether they're back when they're back in the Midwest. And uh, going back to page six, when the uh, initial water rate comparison, Lake Havasu is on the bottom left. What is the EP core Havasu? EPCOR? Yeah. So EPCOR is a private water utility that operates within the Lake Havasu city boundary. So some residents of Lake Havasu are on the, the city system and then some are on the private system. So if you're in EPCOR's service area, then you would have that higher. Is, is, are they a specific area? Do we know what, what the area they are? Yes. With regard to uh, commercial, you had, so you lowered the number of classes. What, what were those classes again that that was lowered to? That we've lowered them to? Yes. You had a lot and you yeah. lowered it to like three. Yeah, so we've lowered it to residential. So we've got single family, apartments, condos, multifamily. Um, and then we've got a commercial class, a hotel, motel class, and then RV park class. My suggestion is, is that putting all the commercial structures under one rate may not be fair. I represent a commercial property interest because I'm on the board of that property owners association. And the suggestion is, I, I would suggest having at least two. Okay. Two classes, low use, high use. That because I know for a fact that our units don't use a lot of water and we were thinking we're going to be very burdened by a huge increase. So if we were classified low usage, then we'd be fine with it. But I know there are higher use structures, so you would obviously have to compensate for that. That's really the only suggestion I have. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions from you both? All right. Thank you very much. And certainly this is not <laughs> this is not the last time I'll be here. So if something else comes up, feel free to email Anthony and wait or wait till I come back and we're happy to get additional feedback. Yes. There's going to be, I'll take it. Uh, okay. There's going to be a number of upcoming meetings with council. Uh, the potential plan for adopting rates is that September, October timeframe period. Open to the public. Open to the public. Yep.